Chapter 9, we're looking at international trade. This is a relatively short chapter with a few main objectives. These objectives include using welfare analysis of free trade um, in a country that's exporting a good versus not trading a good. And we're also doing welfare analysis of free trade for a good that a country imports uh, versus not importing. Um, and looking at the welfare analysis of a tariff relative to free trade in a good that a country imports. And then lastly, um, looking at the most common arguments for restricting imports and um, a typical economist's response to each. So we're looking at imports and exports, um, doing welfare analysis um, to see if a country is better off with trade or not. And then we're looking at, looking at things like a tariff um, versus free trade situation. So an introduction, we recall from chapter 3, a country has a comparative advantage in a good if it produces the good at a lower opportunity cost than other countries. Again, opportunity cost being the operative word. Countries can gain from trade if each exports the goods in which it has a comparative advantage. Okay. Now, we're going to apply the tools of welfare no economics to see where these gains come from and who gets them. Now, looking at world price and comparative advantage, PW is the world price of a good, the price that prevails in world markets. Now, think about it this way. We're, we're not just talking about the price of something in South Carolina, in Spartanburg County, in the United States. We're looking at the price of something across the world. Okay. Now, compare the world price to a domestic price without trade. So, the price that something would be domestically if it were not traded on the world market. So a smaller market, just say, within the United States. If the uh, domestic price is uh, less than the world price, a country has an advantage in the good. Under free trade, this country exports that good. They have that comparative advantage. They have an advantage over everyone else in the world because their costs are lower, because the price is lower. However, if the domestic price is greater than the world price, the country does not have a comparative advantage. Under free trade, a country would import that good because others can produce it um, uh, at a lower price. It's important to notice, notice that the um, PW and PD you see here on the slide in this lecture are actually not in the textbook. Um, we're just referring to them here in shorthand, um, which helps. Um, feel free to do so in the homework and on the tests. Um, world price and domestic price abbreviated as PW and PD. So, the small economy assumption, um, people assume that a small economy is a price taker in world markets. Its actions have no effects on, um, on world price. But this is not always true, especially in the U.S. But for our purposes, we're going to use it to simplify the analysis without changing um, the lesson here. When a small economy engages in free trade, um, the world price is is only re is only irrelevant is the, is the only relevant price because it, um, it's it's the market is no longer just domestic; it's worldwide. So no seller would accept a price um, less than the world price, since she could sell the goods um, for that price in world markets, and no buyer would pay more than the world price, since he can buy the good. Um, for that price on a world market. So it becomes the prevailing price, world price does. Let's do an example here of a country that exports soybeans. Uh, a real life example here may be Brazil. Um, you may not be aware of the economic importance of soybeans. Sounds like kind of a, a boring um, commodity to, to use as an illustration. But however, soybeans um, are big business in the U.S. In 2012, which is some of the more recent data we have, soybeans were grown in more than 30 states in the United States. Um, farmers produced 3 billion bushels of soybeans, which was worth $43 million. The U.S. earned $19 billion from um, soybean exports. So... Um, kind of a big deal. Um, but I should alert you that just in a moment, um, 
we're going to do some analysis very similar to the analysis shown on this this and the following slide so be sure to follow along we're going to re repeat kind of the process we're doing here in this case we're looking at an example where the domestic price is less than the world price so the country in this example you can see this us brazil whoever will export soybeans uh, the important, or excuse me, the quantity of exports is, is simply the difference between um, the domestic quantity supplied and the, the domestic quantity demanded at a world price. So how much soybeans you produce um, is the quantity supplied versus how much your country uh, consumes and that difference is available for export. So let's look at this a couple different ways. So without trade, in this slide, um, we have supply and demand. Um, the price domestic is $4, and the quantity um, sold is 500 Okay. However, on the world market, soybeans are getting $6. Okay. They're fetching a price of $6. So this is a domestic supply and demand, uh, a domestic price, and then we overlay the world price. Okay. So under free trade, domestic consumers, um, again, the world price is going to prevail because suppliers are going to want it, and sellers are going to want to um, not uh, pay as much, so they're going to consume less. So we have demand. We move from a quantity here to here because the price went up because we're subject to the world market. But at the world market price is higher, suppliers want to ramp up production of soybeans because they're going to be able to export them. So in this situation, we overlay the world price, and assuming that the world price is the prevailing price, um, domestic consumers are going to demand 300 units, okay, maybe 300,000 bushels, um, what have you. Um, domestic producers, however, are going to produce 750 because they're real tickled with the $6 price they're getting in here, okay. Well, that leaves a difference of 750 and 300. Well, that leaves 400,000 bushels to export. And this is without trade. Well, without trade, we're looking at a consumer surplus of A plus B, because again, we're operating at a, a $4 price without that world price, or without that world price being involved. We're looking at a um, consumer plus of A plus B. Any producer surplus above the supply curve and below the, the domestic price of $4 of C, and a total surplus of A plus B plus C. With trade, however, um, the surplus, the consumer surplus, again, they're going to consume less if we move up to this world price of $6, it's just A. And producer surplus becomes this area B plus C plus D. So there's a significant gain from trade here in area D. Okay. So just moving from not, um, not trading, which was A, B plus C, and then deciding to trade, which um, benefits greater uh, surplus benefit to, con to um, producers of B, D, and C here. Um, the trade benefits soybean producers because they can sell at a higher price, uh, $6 versus $4. Producer surplus rises by the area B plus D. Um, consumer surplus goes down by the area B and is on, consists of only area A. The trade trade makes domestic buyers worse off because they can um, they have to pay a higher price and thus consumer surplus falls to area B. The gains to producers are greater than the losses to consumers, so trade o increases the overall total welfare. Total surplus rises by the amount of of area D. So overall, total surplus is up, so trade is a good thing. So again, let's repeat this, but in, a, in a, an example situation, um, in our analysis of trade. The two preceding slides showed you the analysis of trade when a country exports. The next step is to cover the analysis of a trade when a country imports a, a good. So... Um, we're going to work through this exercise and do the analysis ourselves. Um, it's a good good opportunity to get you to um, have a chance to see the technique being applied. Um, you'll also get an opportunity to do this in your homework as well. 
Um, so without trade, uh, in this situation, we're looking at plasma TVs. So we shifted gears from soybeans. Um, the domestic price is three thousand dollars. Okay, that's where supply and demand come together. Equilibrium and the quantity sold is four hundred. Okay, easy enough. However, in world markets, the world price is fifteen hundred. Okay, so roughly half the domestic price. Under free trade, how many TVs um, will the uh, country import or export? Well, first of all, we've got to look at the prices and see whether they will be an import or export. Then we're going to identify consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total surplus without trade and with trade. Now, under free trade, um, domestic consumers will demand 600 plasma TVs. Okay, if you remember back... The domestic was only producing 400, but price in the world has um, the world has lowered the price um, to 1500, so cut it in half. So they're going to demand 600 with this demand curve. Um, domestic producers will supply 200, okay? Because before they were getting three thousand dollars for every plasma TV they were selling. Now they're only getting 1500, so they're only going to sell 200, given this supply curve. The uh, domestic price is greater than the world price. Therefore, this country will have to import plasma TV sets from abroad. The quantity of imports is simply the difference between the quantity demanded by domestic consumers and the quantity supplied by domestic firms at the world price. So again, the world price supersedes. Um, the domestic price is higher, so they're going to import, and at what, what amount will this country, this fictitious country, whatever it is, the United States, wherever, um, well, it's going to be the difference between this quantity demanded and the quantity supply. You have an excess quantity demanded of 400, so you're going to need to import 400 plasma televisions. Now, looking at this situation without trade, Trade benefits consumers in this case because it allows them to buy plasma TVs at lower prices so more consumers can afford plasma TVs if imports were allowed. Thus, you sell more plasma TVs. The gains to the consumer appear on the graph as the areas B plus D, which represents the increase in consumer surplus when the country allows trade. In this example, trade harms domestic producers because they now must sell their plasma TVs at a lower price, 1500 versus 3000 As a result, they produce a smaller quantity. They're getting less, they produce a smaller quantity, and thus they earn less revenue, and they're likely to let go some of their workers. So we're losing a little bit of, of, of um, jobs to overseas. These losses are represented on the graph by area B. Okay, which represents the fall in producer surplus resulting, in tra uh, resulting from trade. As the graph shows, the gains to consumers outweigh the losses to producers. Therefore, total surplus increases by the amount shown by D, which represents the gains from trade in plasma TV sets. Okay, so originally we were trading at 3000 and selling this quantity. And we had a consumer surplus of A and a producer surplus of B and C. However, the world prevailing world price is fifteen hundred. What happens? Hey, TVs are a lot more uh, uh, affordable. Three thousand, uh, fifteen hundred versus three thousand. So I'm going to want this amount. Suppliers are saying, hey, we're getting paid. Domestic suppliers are saying, hey, we're getting paid a whole lot less. That sends a signal to us that we need to produce a whole lot less because we can't compete as much. We can't make as much money there. Um, thus, the uh, producer surplus moves to A, not only just A, but A, B, and D, and um, domestic producer surplus is just area C. So it hurts the, the, the domestic producers, but overall the economy gains area D, and so it's a plus. Okay, so trade may make one group lose and one group win, but as long as the winners are gaining enough to justify um, losing, so we didn't exactly lose area B as a society, we just switched who got it from, from producers to consumers. Um, there is an overall gain, we still have this whole surplus here of ABC, but there's an overall gain of this area D.
So, in this case, trade is a good thing, unless you're one of the workers that gets laid off. But look at it this way. TVs are less expensive if you find a new job. So, in summary, this is an excellent, excellent table if you're just going to memorize something for this chapter. I'm not saying just memorize this. You need to know the whole chapter. However, this is an excellent way of looking at it. Whether a good is imported or exported, trade creates winners and losers. But the gains... But when the gains exceed the, lose, the, the losses, it's a win for everyone. Um, if, price, if the domestic price is less than the world price, a country is going to be able to export a good. They're going to be able to produce more because they have an advantage in price. Okay? They're going to export that good. Consumer surplus is going to fall, and producer surplus is going to rise. And total surplus rises. Now, these are general rules. If the domestic price is higher than the world price, then a country is going to import. Consumer surplus is going to rise because they'll be able to get that lower world price. Producer surplus is going to fall because they can't produce at a, at a, on the world market as well as outside producers can. And total surplus is going to rise, as was illustrated in the last two examples. There are some other benefits to international trade. Consumers enjoy increased variety of goods. You go to the grocery store and there's a wide variety of fruit and vegetables from all over the world. Producers sell to a larger market and may achieve lower costs by producing on a larger scale. Okay, so there's more customers for producers to um, serve. And by producing on a larger scale, you can build efficiencies. Competition from abroad may reduce the market power of domestic firms, which in, which in turn could increase total welf welfare. Essentially, competition is always a good thing, especially if you're a consumer. It builds efficiency among firms. You either get efficient or you run out of the market. And it also gives those consumers those increased variety of goods. And also at lower prices, which is a good thing. Trading enhances the flow of ideas and facilitates the spread of technology around the world. So, um, for example, in, in the television example, um, domestic producers reduce. However, there, when there's more if, um, goods being uh, coming to the market um, from uh, foreign areas, it could give domestic producers an idea. Um, say, hey, the, the Japanese television have this feature. Maybe we can add that and find some way to enhance it, and that competition um, moves the technological ball down the field and also um, can lower costs on consumers and give them all kinds of neat little gadgets. So why is there all the opposition to trade then? Well, recall from uh, the 10 principles in Chapter 1, trade can make everyone better off. The winners from trade can compensate the losers and still be better off. Yet, such compensation rarely occurs. So the gainers, say from that area, they got area D in the, the overall um, uh, trade example that we had here. Uh, go back to this where we gain this area D. That all goes to consumer surplus. It'd be neat to find a way that you could chop up some of area D and compensate um, the producers for what they lost. Well... Such compensation now really rarely occurs. The losses are often highly concentrated among a small group of people who, who feel them acutely, i.e. the people who are laid off from the plasma TV producing um, factory. The gains are often spread thinly over many, many people who may not see how the trade benefits them. So it could be subtle to them overall, but overall it's, it's a huge win for the economy. Hence, the losers have more incentive to organize and lobby for the restrictions on trade, uh, create special interest groups and, say, go to Washington, D.C. and try to create things like tariffs that put them more even um, playing field. Uh, an example would be back in December of 2005 when thousands of protesters gathered outside the meeting place of the World Trade Organization, um, talks that were being held in Hong Kong that year, um, some, pro some of the protests turned violent, and the police made over 900 arrests. So obviously those people, um, 900 people, when you talk about the entire world, is just um, a very, very small group. However, they were very upset about something that was going on um, as a result of free trade.
Perhaps they were laid off plasma TV producers. So one of the tools um, used to restrict trade when, when uh, policymakers implement them is a tariff. A tariff is nothing more than a tax, uh, but it's a tax placed on imports. A good example will be cotton shirts. Let's say the world price is $20, and a tariff is placed on it uh, at $10 a shirt. So every time you sell a shirt, uh, the price is $20 on the world market. However, you add a tariff um, here in the U.S. that raises that um, shirt cost, that raises that shirt price that you pay by $10. So consumers must pay $30 for an imported shirt, and um, uh, which protects producers that are saying charging $30 now. So if you went to the store and you had the exact same sh shirt, cotton shirt, um, that you could buy for $20 that was imported or $30 that was domestic, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to buy the uh, le less expensive $20 shirt. Well, let's say that cotton shirt producers lobby in Washington for a $10 tariff to level the playing field, and both shirts are $30, and it's no longer a slam dunk into which, as to which shirt you choose. In fact, um, you're more than likely going to choose the domestic shirt. Um, in general, the price facing domestic buyers and sellers um, equals the, the world price plus a tariff when a tariff is present. So let's look at this graphically. Let's say the price, uh, the world price is $20, um, as illustrated here in the red line. Okay, coin demand is going to be higher than it normally would be in equilibrium. Okay, uh, quantity supplied is here. Coin demand is here. Um, they're not they're not getting as much for their shirt, twenty dollars. Um, so producers wouldn't supply as much. All right, buyers would demand eighty, and sellers would supply twenty five. That means there's an import of uh, fifty five, uh, let's say thousand t-shirts. Now let's add in that tax of ten dollars a shirt, which r price rises from twenty dollars to thirty dollars. Buyers now demand seventy t-shirts, and so uh, domestic so sellers supply forty. Okay, so they moved up from twenty-five to forty. They sold more at a higher price, um, and imports reduce uh, are reduced to thirty. So there's less foreign competition in this market with a tariff. So, um, in this example, with free trade, again, at the world price of $20, consumer surplus is A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F. So this entire triangle here, going down to the world price, is the consumer surplus with free trade. We have a world price of $20. So the area above the price curve and below the demand curve is this massive consumer surplus. Producer surplus is the area above the supply curve and below the price, again, the world price of $20, is just G. Okay, so total surplus is A plus B plus C plus D plus E plus F plus G. All right. Now in a market where we have a tariff, um, consumer surplus uh, changes because price rises to 30. The area above the price curve and below the demand curve, consumer surplus, is just A and B now. Okay. The producer surplus is the area above, uh, or excuse me, below the price and above the supply curve, which is just C and G. Um, the revenue, extra revenue generated from the tariff, again, that's going to be $10 per shirt. Okay is, um, again, the revenue is, 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 it's the tax revenue here, and the revenue from the tariff is area E. It's this rectangle right in the middle, okay? Moving from the quantity supplied to the quantity demanded, that is what we have left. This gap in here is what we're going to have to import. Again, 40 to 30, or 40 to 70 is 30, so we're going to import 30 shirts. Those 30 shirts get $10 a shirt, so that's, that's 300 um, dollars in tariff revenues. Let's say we're talking about hundreds of thousands of t-shirts here. Um, um, you could be talking millions of dollars in, in short order. Okay, So you have to count that revenue towards that surplus. 
So we have A plus B plus C plus E plus G is the total surplus. So the tariff benefits domestic producers by allowing them to sell for a higher price, and the producer surplus increases by C. The tariff makes consumers worse off because they have to pay a higher price. Consumer surplus falls by the area C plus D plus E plus F. The tariff generates revenue for the government equal to E. Okay. The loss from the tariff exceeds the gains, so total welfare falls. The, the tariff reduces total surplus by areas D and F. We lose these pink areas here. So if you look at overall, hey, with free trade, we get all these areas. And with a tariff, we only get these areas. Which one's bigger? Free trade. Which one are we better off with? Free trade. Now, D, when we look at areas D and F that we lost, um, we, we remember a tariff is a tax. Like taxes we studied in, in the previous chapters, um, the tariff causes a deadweight loss because it distorts incentives. Here, the tariff causes the economy to devote more resources to a good that would be produced at a lower opportunity cost in other countries. Essentially, it artificially raises the price on consumers. This causes a deadweight loss represented on the graph by area D. Also, the tariff gives consumers an incentive to purchase a smaller quantity because they're paying more. This is the, 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 the result of uh, is a deadweight loss on area F in the graph. Okay? So area D is the deadweight loss from the overproduction of, of shirts because consumers, or excuse me, domestic producers move from producing 25 to 40. So this area lost here is a, resu a result of, um, um, of the tariff artificially inflating how much um, uh, producers, um, how many t-shirts they produce are. Uh, is artificially influenced, so we lose this area D. And then F is the deadweight loss for the, from the underconsumption of shirts. Okay, price went up, so when you know something becomes more expensive, consumers are going to want less of it. So instead of buying the 80 they would at the world market price, um, they reduce it um, back to this point here on the demand curve at the $30 price, and we lose the surplus area of F. So there is total deadweight loss of D plus F, but they're there for different reasons. This is the deadweight loss, D is the deadweight loss from the production overproduction of shirts, and F is the um, deadweight loss from the underconsumption of shirts. So overproduction and underconsumption. Now, looking at import quotas, um, it's another way to restrict trade. So we had the tariff, and now we're going to look at an import quota, which is a quantitative limit on the imports of a good. Mo uh, mostly, this has the same effects as a tariff. It raises the price and reduces the quantity of imports. It reduces a buyer's welfare because it limits how much, um, how many goods can be in a market, and it increases the seller's welfare because, well, they benefit from having less competition. A tariff creates revenue for a government, just like a tax, because tariff essentially is a tax. A quota creates profits for the foreign producers of the imported goods who can sell them at a higher price. It makes their product more rare. So when something's more rare, um, it's less available in a market, it has a higher value. Or a government could auction licenses, an, an alternative here, less use alternative, but it's an option. Government could auction licenses to import um, to capture profit from this revenue. It usually does not, though. So, again, the emphasis here will be on tariffs. Um, it's important to know what import quotas are. Tariffs are more widely used. Okay. Now, let's look at some common arguments for restricting trade. Uh, the first and most common argument is the jobs argument. Trade destroys jobs in industries that can compete with ex imports. I hear this every um, campaign season. You will hear it this campaign season, I guarantee you. An economist's response is total unemployment does not rise as imports rise because job losses from imports are offset by job gains to export industries. So essentially, um, uh, total unemployment, um, total number of unemployed persons does not necessarily rise as imports rise. 
because there's a shift in what you do, okay? Um, if a country loses jobs making plasma TVs but gains jobs making um, or exporting computers, um, those are somewhat equally trained positions. Maybe the people who were making um, the TVs before move into a job that involves making computers. That's not always necessarily a perfect trade-off. However, the overall job gained and jobs lost, um, the data has proven that total unemployment does not necessarily rise as imports rises. Um, by using uh, decade averages, so looking at decades here across the bottom, um, 60s to 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and to 2010, the most recent complete decade, uh, by using decade averages, the short-term noise and fluctuations average out, which makes long-term trends easier to see. Unemployment hovers around 6% while imports keep trending up. So indeed, the period from 1981 to 2000 sees unemployment fall while imports rise. So that addresses that first issue here. Um, now, it's important to point out that this data does not appear in the textbook. I include it here because I think it's effective. Um, but it's not, it's not in supported in the text bank or study guide, so please um, don't feel like you have to have this memorized. It's just more of an, an, a one-off um, information we found with the St. Louis Federal Reserve. So imports rising, unemployment rose a little bit, but it's pretty much leveled off around 6%. Now, we know it's been more um, since the Great Recession, but um, overall, um, while we can see an upward trend at times in unemployment, we've seen it sort of flatten out here as imports have skyrocketed. So that really addresses the jobs argument um, that we so commonly see. The second argument for restricting trade is the national security argument. Um, someone, they say, hey, an industry is vital to the national security and should be protected from foreign competition to prevent a dependence on Im imports that could be disrupted during wartime or conflict. Um, economist's response is fine. If trade restrictions based, um, true secure, or based on true security needs, um, fine. But producers may exaggerate their own importance to national security to obtain production from um, foreign competition. Be a hard argument for, say, the plasma TV people to make to say, hey, man, our national security depends on us here. Um, that argument typically is made with things like uh, agricultural production. It's like, hey, we don't need to be 100% dependent on other countries for our food because what if we go to war with them? We won't have any food. Okay, maybe you have a point. Maybe not. Um, the third argument for restricting trade is the infant industry argument. Um, an infant industry is a new industry that argues that um, they need temporary protection until it's mature and can compete with foreign firms. Hey, you got to help us get off the ground. We can, the foreign firms are gonna um, gonna kill our business before we even get started. Economists' response uh, is typically. Um, it's difficult for government to determine which industries will eventually be able to compete and whether benefits of establishing these industries exceed the cost to consumers of restricting in imports. Um, it, it, besides, if a firm will be profitable in the long run, it should be willing to incur temporary losses. That's just an, an efficiency argument. Um, it's no way to predict if, a, if an industry will in fact be... Um, uh, a long-run success and even more far-fetched to expect a government to be able to project that. So the infant industry argument typically holds um, a little more water in um, smaller countries than the U.S. There's so much competition within the U.S. If you, if you have a, a, um, an industry that has real potential, you're generally able to get investors in, in, in this side of the world. Um, number four arguments for restricting trade, common arguments, is the unfair competition argument. Producers argue their competitors in another country have an unfair advantage. Um, for example, uh, a producer in China gets government subsidies to prop itself up. Um, economist response is, we should welcome imports from low-cost products subsidized by other countries' taxpayers because we didn't have to pay for them. And the gains to our consumers will exceed the losses to our, to our producers. So, hey, if somebody wants to subsidize our ability to buy something um, um, 
less at a less expensive rate, hey, have at it. Uh, fifth argument here, fifth and final, I believe, is the protection as a bargaining chip argument, um, as an argument for restricting trade. An example would be the U.S. can threaten to limit imports of French wine unless France lifts, quota, lifts their quotas on American beef. So there can be a little, little tit for tat there, um, a little trade off in terms of who's, um, in, in, who is putting on tariffs and who's putting on um, limits. So an economist response would be, suppose France refuses to, to make that deal, so we, then the U.S. must choose between two bad options. Restrict the imports from France, which reduces the welfare of the U.S., and uh, don't restrict imports, which reduces the U.S. credibility. They just made that threat, and they're not going to back it up, or they go through with the threat just to look like the big boy on the block, only to hurt the consumers. So, of course, this argument and response is meant to apply more generally than a specific example described with the U.S. and France. I think we get along with them just fine. Um, but most non-economic, um, most people with non-economic backgrounds can more easily learn from a general concept if they use, uh, or, um, if you start with a specific concept. So, um, this example here is just used to make the um, the protection as a bargaining chip argument a little more clear. So. Um, it, it, this is flawed, um, the protection as a bargaining chip, because uh, typically it breaks down international relations and um, ends up with no one really winning, and generally speaking, people gravitate to the market approach anyway, the world market approach. So, um, trade agreements. Um, a country can liberalize trade with unilateral reductions in trade restrictions and multilateral lateral agreements with other nations. Examples here of trade agreements would be the North American Free Trade um, Agreement, which is NAFTA, drafted and agreed upon in 1993, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is um, an ongoing um, uh, agreement between uh, multilateral countries, um, known as uh, General Agreed Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, widely known as GATT. Um, then you have the World Trade Organization, WTO, which is established in 1985, which enforces trade agreements and resolves disputes. So it's kind of a, kind of a UN of trade, if you will. So, in summary, a country will export a good if the world price of the good is higher than domestic price without trade. Trade raise, raises uh, producer surplus, reduces consumer surplus, and raises total surplus. A country will import a good if the world price is lower than domestic price without trade, and trade lowers producer surplus but raises consumer surplus and total surplus. So there's different winners and losers, and as long as the overall surplus is going up, your economy is moving in the right direction. A tariff benefits producers because it makes foreign competition, um, their, their products more expensive because there's a tariff attached to it now. It's a tax. Um, and generates revenue for the government. But losses um, to the consumers exceed these gains. So in general, it's, it's not the best idea. Common arguments for restricting trade include protecting jobs, defending national security, helping infant industries, preventing unfair competition, and responding to foreign trade restrictions. Some of these arguments have merit in some cases, but economists believe free trade is usually the better policy usually results in better efficiencies, more surplus, and better equity. Um, free trade can take third world countries and move them up and give them better living conditions. Um, it can move the U.S. from a manufacturing type nation to a service-based nation where incomes are on the rise um, compared to other world nations. And uh, in general, it's just going to be more efficient and better. You can have more choices as a consumer. You can have a bigger market as a seller. In general, international trade, free trade, is a very, very good thing. Okay, this wraps up Chapter 9, uh, International Trade. If you have any questions about the reading, about the homework, or anything, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'll reply, reply generally very quickly, or give me a call during office hours. Thank you so much. Have a great one.